Hi, and uh, good evening, everybody. Oh, good evening here in uh, the UK anyway, and wherever else you are, morning, afternoon, or otherwise. And a very warm welcome to our 48th edition of How to Repair Pendulum Clocks Open Clock Club. And um, before I forget, remember that these sessions are recorded. So if you want to remain anonymous, then please keep your camera turned off. Otherwise, it's lovely to see you all, particularly uh, any new beginners out there, which is fundamentally why we are here. And uh, yeah, remember that um, this kind of the uh, visual side of it is half the deal here. The other half of the deal is in the chat, which I already see is up to 11. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, in the uh, kind of toolbar thing, there's a function called chat. If you click on that, then you can type uh, questions and comments and um, all that stuff. So please let us know who you are, where you are, and what you are up to. Okay, as always, um, every week gets busier, how it seems to do anyway on the orological front. We started uh, about a year ago now as a kind of support um, function for lockdown and people who have bought our book and beginners in horology and it's kind of grown and grown and grown and we've expanded a bit and uh, we said we would do 50 of these sessions and we're now on our 48th so keeping everything crossed that we have a nice clear run to the end anyway the uh, last few weeks we've been talking about a facebook poll that we did where we asked uh, the members, and there are about 1,200 or so members on our Facebook group now of the same name, uh, what do you find in clocks like the common faults? And the reason for this, the motivation, isn't to be negative and pick fault with people's work, um, but it's to support people when they get a clock and they're repairing it and they have a problem to get it to function uh, well or function at all in the fact basically uh, it came out of you know you've got a clock it doesn't work how do you work through the fault finding in order to work through the fault finding we thought it'd be useful to know what the faults were in the first place perceived or otherwise that people find so we've been doing this and we are now right at the top of the list conveniently with uh, number one the uh, survey by the way is still um, on the Facebook group pinned to the top. I've actually added two more things this week. Or I added one and somebody else added one. And I'm going to leave it there live because I think it's an incredibly useful uh, bit of work. In fact, it would be useful one day if somebody, uh, that might be me or anybody else who wants to do, wrote it up because I think it would make a good uh, sort of blog or maybe even article for a journal or something like that. But anyway, so... Number one on our list, and I forget how many votes it's got at the moment. Let me have a little look. No, phone isn't working. Uh, anyway, it had 30 odd votes, but it was by and far the, uh, the sort of front runner. And that was, I mean, oiling isn't a fault per se. Maybe zero, no oil is a, a fault. But anyway, you get what I mean. It's an issue that can cause a problem. And I think people with oiling, they get very, like a lot of these things, once you, you start to get up the top end of things that are popular, um, oiling really begins to uh, sort of um, make people quite animated and they get a bit hot under the collar um, about the whole thing. And I, so it would be useful to kind of consider why people get excited about it. I notice on other YouTube channels and things people also get very excited about what kind of oil you should put in your car engine so maybe it's just something that's very kind of visible and it's quite easy maybe to make a change whereas other things like um i don't know like making stuff or that whole issue about depth thing in bushing and stuff it's a little bit more difficult to get into where oiling looks kind of simple on the outside you get some oil and you uh, put it on the clock. So bearing in mind that uh, I've seen other fora get very excited about oiling, I thought, no, wait a minute, there must be a sort of more diplomatic way to approach this. So I broke it down in my mind, at least, and I'm sure you'll let me know 
in the chat what you think. Oh, by the way, we've got Team Open Clock Club running the chat and we're already up to 23 exchanges. So well done there. Um, so I thought we'd break it down into three uh, areas. Firstly, let's just have a little overview of oiling in clocks. From what I know, I'm not a tribologist, I'm not an engineer, I'm not lots of things. I'm a kind of roaming clock maker, so please take everything I take, say with a pinch of salt. So um, oiling, yeah, uh, most clocks, the vast majority of clocks we're likely to come across uh, basically comprise of, um, I like this, in fact, this isn't a clock, but it's a nice example of a brass plate, um, or even if it's a wooden plate, normally you have a brass bearing, you know, a bush or something there. So you've got a simple bearing comprising a steel axle or arbor that rotates within a fixed uh, brass pole. So that's about, I think, as simple a bearing as you can get, just two um, components and when they rotate in relation to one another there's friction and wear and we apply oil to that bearing to reduce friction and reduce wear and um, the whole reason why clocks are made out of uh, steel and brass in the first place is because steel and brass are relatively well you know not common materials but they're relatively accessible materials in a kind of industrial age and they have a relatively low uh, friction of co uh, coefficient of friction so if you were to make your clock out of brass axles and brass plates or steel axles steel axles or steel plates then you would have ma similar materials together which don't work as well now somebody's putting their hand up i'm sure and saying now wait a minute matthew in the old days the sort of renaissance period you often see or sometimes see iron clocks uh, with iron plates and you do and the vast majority of those as far as I um, know have been improved by fitting brass bushes but I think there's a big difference between raw iron and modern steel that this is made out of raw iron has got a lot of I think they call it rosettes of carbon which actually makes it quite slippery as a material but anyway rant 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 ramble ramble the majority of clocks we come across have got a brass uh, bearing housing and a steel axle that rotates within it and so we add oil to it and um, that oil is problematic I mean I, I oh damn I meant to look it up but I, I don't know whether anybody did their homework and looked up the Abraham Louis Breguet um, saying but anyway paraphrasing of Breguet uh, he said if you give me the perfect oil I'll give you the perfect watch and we saw last week we had a little vial of chronometer oil whale oil and if you think back to the age of uh, say John Harrison uh, developing those marine timekeepers became known as chronometers um, it's one thing having an oil in a stable environment but of course uh, in that particular sort of um, episode they were taking those timekeepers or timekeeper pieces on long voyages, so months, if not years at a time, and also taking them to uh, the Arctic and taking them to the tropics. So um, getting a natural or animal oil that would operate over that range was particularly difficult. However, that's not our problem because most of the domestic environments with which we're, de we're not dealing with turret clocks here, you would have to ask uh, a turret clock maker um, that question what they use where the turret clocks up in the tower and it's freezing and then it's hot during summer our environment most of them are really well controlled in ter terms of temperature because we humans either put the heating on or we put the aircon on if you have aircon and keep the temperature about 20 degrees centigrade and uh, give or take so that's absolutely fine. Our big problem as far as oil concert is concerned is the fact that um, oil gets contaminated with airborne dust. And this is in every horological repair book you ever read. I don't think anybody's not said this. Um, the National uh, Trust, um, I think you were looking at the other day, weren't you? Yeah, nod nodding from um, Team Open Clock Club, did a really cool survey the other day uh, on dust, not the other day, the other year, on dust, sorry. And um, uh, what they found 
pretty obviously really was that the dust within a building varies massively depending on primarily on things like convection currents so if you've got a clock in an entrance hall and this is where it's of use to us in terms of that killer question how often should a clock be serviced and i don't ever give an answer to that um but i know some people are quite vociferous about it and say it has to be done every three years, five years, 10 years, or whatever, you know, anyway, each of their own. And of course, the reality is that what we're talking about when we service a clock are two things primarily. One is the safety of the clock. So things like lines and ratchet clicks and so on. But the other one is the lubrication. What's happened to the lubrication? And that very much depends on its location within a property and the location of a property. If you imagine if it's in a city, you're going to get very different airborne dust from if it's in the countryside, uh, for instance. And in fact, we were talking the other day, uh, you know, a lot, not all the clocks we work on are um, many are 18th century, uh, some are late 17th century, some are even 16th century, very occasionally. But the 18th century ones, the environment, of course, in the sort of pre industrial. Uh, error was incredibly different from today here we live in a city with a road and basically that means that there's a lot of inorganic dust so uh, quartz mica that kind of thing in the air that lands on the clock oil so that's the big problem as far as we're concerned with clocks they tend not to be in sealed cases unlike watches which are even like dress watches are still relatively sealed compared to a uh, um, a, a clock and that came up because I got some really cool feedback on one of my YouTube videos about the use of synthetic oils in clocks so we'll get onto that in a bit so clocks have to be oiled and if you want to avoid unnecessary wear that oil has to be either replenished or ideally washed away and completely renewed on a, a periodic basis, depending on the type of clock and the dust tightness of the case uh, and where the clock is. So uh, well worth looking up that National Trust dust survey thing. If you go around uh, museums and historic houses, you'll often see little microscope um, slides, you know, the little glass things um, dotted around on horizontal surfaces and they are dust traps. So they basically, look at the amount of dust and compare it to uh, known samples. Not a lot you can do about dust, a bit like our age, but um, that's the reason we uh, changed the oil. Okay, so my top three kind of staged easy guide to the problem of oiling is that the first thing before you even think about what kind of oil is oil or no oil. And there's no doubt about it that irrespective of what kind of oil it is, if you go down the shop and buy some sunflower oil for frying your chips in, um, or lard as we use in the north of England, if Sam's is Sam there? No. Oh, no Sam there, okay. Well, that was for Sam that joke anyway. Uh, anyway, if you just go around the, down the shop and get, you know, cooking oil, it's better to have that on your clock than no oil at all. And we often see this on um, Skew's fingers. I'll just get some gloves. I had them a minute ago. There they are. Um, we often see, for some reason, certain bearings in certain clocks tend to fail quicker than others. And the classic one on the tall case, 18th, 19th century tall case clock is a center wheel back pivot. And I don't quite know why that is, but it's uh, in bits, many of them, live screen clock. So it's going to stick. Yeah, question. So the first, Viv Ashish is saying, do you talk about renewing oil or replacing oil? Ah, uh, well, we'll get onto that in that stage three. Okay, stage three. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's actually stage one as well. So um, Devashi has picked up on the fact that I said um, sort of renewing or replenishing and completely washing away and replacing. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get onto that. So this pivot here, which is your centre wheel back pivot, in fact, on this clock, actual clock, had failed completely the lubrication 
it had dried up, the pivot had been grinding and grinding and grinding away, and uh, it was so uh, sort of badly mushroomed that even me, and I really never, hardly ever polish or anything pivots, um, chopped it off and replaced it. It might have even been broken off altogether, but anyway. Um, so there's a problem. Uh, people often say, you know, how worn is that clock? Or particularly with things like more complex objects like automaton, how worn is that thing? And, you know, the, I was looking, I've been servicing uh, on site this week, clocks uh, and adding oil to them primarily. And it's crazy that in one object, you can have basically uh, oils, uh, bearings that are really kind of almost overflowing with oil and some that seem completely dry and it seems almost inexplicable why that is. But anyway, in this case, I think this bearing fails because for the load, um, it's relatively small. And the second thing is it's the back of the clock. So you tend to get those convection currents again uh, running up the back of the case there. But I don't know, it would be interesting to see if anybody ever did any uh, any uh, research on that. So there's, there's your answer, really. Some oil is better than no oil. Um, I've heard of people when they, I mean, this may be a myth, but when they've repaired a clock, uh, somebody once advised to give it a dry run, you know, to check everything was in order before you oil it. I wouldn't do that um, at all. But primarily, I wouldn't do it just in case you forget. Part of the interesting conversation that was sort of feedback on YouTube was about objects that are in storage. And that doesn't really apply to us because probably not many of us deal with uh, those organizations where a lot of the objects are not actually either working or on display. So we'll probably not go there because that's just a big distraction, but it's an interesting question. Um, what do you, do you oil a clock or oil a watch in this case that isn't actually intended to be used? It's gonna be put into storage. Anyway, so there's the first thing. If you put some oil on and you check through the train, um, that uh, you've got oil everywhere, or you've got oil in the right place anyway, then that's it. You're kind of sorted as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the second thing will go, as we move down our sort of hierarchy of, uh, of um, resolution, the second thing is how much oil. But before we move on to that, um, because I know we hopefully encourage beginners, let's just, and this will be maybe a bit um, steady away for uh, those more experienced in clocks, but where the heck does the oil go um, when you oil a clock? When you're new to uh, horology, um, if, so somebody bought a book this week and you know they're saying, don't know that, don't know that, which is really great and encouraging because it's so easy to get dragged into the whole thing. Many of us are used to things like um, a push bike, bicycle that you get when you're so many years old. And of course you ride it for a few months and then the chain starts squeaking. So you put oil on the chain, uh, which gets transferred to the sprockets, to the chain ring at the front and the sprocket at the back and everything's uh, quiet again and tickety-boo. And eventually it just gets more and more and more thick, gloopy, contaminated oil on it. Um, we're also, some of us, you kind of uh, okay with the, uh oh, was that me? Um, familiar with the concept of a car engine or a gearbox that's sealed and you pour oil in at the top and it all swirls about basically as the engine's running uh, and then every x number of miles or uh, months you drain all that out and put new oil in. Well a clock is not like that in the sense of the number one thing we should learn is that where the wheels, let's just get this actually into there, Thing if we can see if it will focus. The wheels here and the uh, leaves of the pinions here, so the two gears that intermesh, don't have added lubrication. Again, they're typically brass and steel running together, so they've got a sort of natural, relatively low coefficient of friction. And the reason we don't oil them is not because they would be better off if they were oiled. They probably would be better off if they were oiled. If you could fill the whole thing up with oil like a car gearbox and you had enough energy coming in the bottom end like you do with a car to drive the thing, it would probably be okay. Um, in fact, I, arguably it would run a lot better. But 
and here's the big but in a clock that is not sealed that is massively problematic because what the oil does is it um, attracts that dust we were talking about before and it forms this so-called grinding paste and it wears the teeth and the pinions away so clock gears in involute and cy uh, cycloidal cycloidal primarily primarily in the clocks we tend to work with are kind of designed with what they call low pressure angles not to require lubrication so top tip number one you don't oil the wheel and the pinion so what do you oil you basically you oil everything else i often talk about um in term in uh terms of cleaning differentiating between working and non-working surfaces okay so the non the non-working surfaces here are things like the plate which is just dry um but the working surfaces here are the bearings so where this arbor um what we call an arbor axle rotates in the brass plate here 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 and so on they're all oiled okay so what I call working or bearing surfaces, if we look inside the clock, um, this clock's partly disassembled, of course, but you can see, just with it around this way, um, you've got, uh, there we are, look, you've got a pin there sticking out to the warning wheel. So this pin is to do with the striking, uh, operation of the striking train of the clock. So that pin uh, lands on a piece of, St uh, steel in this case, then it slides along it and drops off. So you have a little bit of oil on there. It's a working surface. Same thing. Oh, I can maybe can't see. Oh yeah, you can see this wheel here has got pins sticking out the side of it. This is called the pinwheel, and it lifts the hammer. If you can see that there wiggling about. So in fact, if you this clock hasn't been oiled yet, you can hear it squeaking. If you ever hear a clock squeaking, like stop the clock and find out which part of the element which part of the thing isn't um isn't oiled so again you have a tiny bit of oil on these uh, pins you have some oil on the uh, axle where the hammer goes through the plate and if we just get a clock slightly more assembled yeah always thought that the center wheel back pivot failed because of the weight of the hands and uneven where as the hands go around. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Maybe it's something to do with the hands being on there as well. Don't know. I, um, I think, again, somebody it would be cool for somebody to do some experimentation. I'm always slight sound, maybe slightly negative about our institutions. And I don't mean to sound negative, of course, but I'm a bit frustrated that there isn't peer reviewed research going on into lubrication and so on, just stepping aside in terms of that research thing. And I think it's a good point, Jeremy. Um, the oil that we are, that I use, is uh, mostly by the company Mobius. We'll get onto this in the third part of the third part of the thing. Um, Mobius is owned by the Swatch Group, and the Swatch Group make money, I hope, from selling watches. So their motivation is not um, skanky old long case clocks like this. They're zero interest in long case clocks because you can't make any money out of them. Whereas you can out of uh, selling high end watches or watches full stop, totally get that good business model. So do bear in mind that those synthetic oils that they uh, produce uh, like this stuff here, um, where is it? There we are, uh, which is a, a watch oil is, is um, developed for uh, watches primarily. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so yeah, maybe Jeremy, I don't know uh, is the answer, but it would be cool to do some uh, research, but it, like time after time, it's that one bearing that seems to dry up and then fail. So just back to our working and non-working surfaces, if uh, we can focus, thank you. So same thing here, um, we've got a pin look on this wheel, which is called the minute wheel. It's to do with the hands going round at the right speed. And that lifts this lever. So you'd have a tiny amount of oil there. You've got a touching point there. You've got a place where this component called the gathering pallet touches on this. So basically everywhere around here, including these posts, these bearings, needs an amount of lubrication. Not the same 
all over, but we'll get onto that, how much oil. That's kind of phase two. So phase one, or, or stage one of our thinking is as a broad generalization, and generalizations are always uh, difficult, of course, is um, uh, oil is better than no oil. Okay, so going back to Devashish's point, and what I've been doing this week, uh, don't really have anything interesting for you to look at, I'm afraid. So maybe we can look at, um, <laughs> look at this while I'm talking. There we go, oil stand. And oilers, which we'll show you how to make without run out of time. Point. So um, going back to this kind of fundamental point about uh, the oil getting contaminated, I don't know what your policy is. It would be really useful, those of you who are dealing with kind of members of the public in particular, when inevitably it's a killer question, you fix a clock and the owner says, how often should you have the clock serviced? And I know, as I said before, some people say X, some people say Y, some people say Z. And I don't say any of those, not that that's right or wrong. What I do say, though, is that what's important is inspection of the state of the lubrication. So without any presupposed ideas, because if the heating in the property is pretty low and the clock is in a relatively dust free place, oil can be fine for years uh, if you've got a really heavily heated uh, property or maybe the clock is on top of a mantelpiece or something which is obviously not a good idea the oil might only last a few months before it evaporates spreads or gets contaminated so one for me one size doesn't fit um doesn't fit all, all at all so the second sort of um sorry am i answering the question i think so D derek's just saying he's got a torsion clock that's been running five fine for five years without oil yeah. And also, I think with a, some, I mean, uh, I did say that most clocks uh, aren't well sealed. And of course, the torsion uh, pendulum or anniversary clock is uh, a bit of an exception to the rule because it typically has a glass shade that is a pretty good fit um, on its base. So the amount of dust getting into the mechanism and also that shade will very much protect that clock from changes in RH and changes in temperature and so on, it will slow all that stuff down. So maybe a torsion pendulum clock is actually an example of a, a clock that's sealed more like a watch. So once we've decided or agreed um, on uh, how the, the thing needs oil in, sort of how much oil, and yeah, what, so what I do and I get paid for, the vast majority of my work with the sort of heritage sector is not cleaning and fixing clocks at all. It's basically looking at the state of the lubrication. And this is a policy, I can't speak for any heritage institution, of course, I'm a contractor, um, but some of those have a policy of a regular maintenance inspection. As I said before, that's basically two things, primarily making sure that the clock isn't going to Damp, fall over and hurt anybody or hurt the people are winding it. So things like ratchet clicks and so on and lines and da da da. And the second thing is looking at the state of the lubrication. Now, this is where it's going to get controversial, but we've dealt with the first thing. So we're at home and dry, really. And that is that one of my super favorite things to do is to on site, there's a lot of risk in taking a clock in my context off site. Um, that you can avoid by working in site is to add lubrication to existing lubrication. And this is a, a controversial point because some people would, might say, I don't know, that's not doing a proper job. You've got to take it apart. You've got to clean it, as they call it, and so on and so forth. And that is true. All things being equal, if you wanted to do, if you wanted the lubrication to be in the best condition you can, then yeah, you would take the thing apart and you would wash it and you would put brand new oil on kind of all the time um, on a very regular basis. However, all that process comes with a cost. It doesn't matter who you get to do the work, however skilled you are, and I'm not saying I'm one of those people at all, um, however experienced you are, there's a lot of risk in taking a clock apart. You can't do it without damaging it. You know, you put your pliers on a pin and a screwdriver, it makes a mark, all that stuff's cumulative. You've got the risk of transporting it and springs breaking, you name it. Anyway, 
there's a whole lot of risk. As I've said before, my kind of work is risk analysis and cost benefit. There's a whole lot of risk and wider sense of cost in taking the thing apart and replacing the oil. And that's reduced massively is if you just take, for instance, the hands and dial off a clock, take the movement out of the case, if it's got one, take the hands and dial off, look at the oil, like, you know, staring at it for about 20 minutes. And then if a, you feel it's appropriate, actually adding new oil to old oil. Now, obviously you can't do that forever. You can only do that for maybe one, two or three cycles at the most. And you either get far too much oil or the whole thing just gets uh, gloopy and contaminated or it starts going acid. And then you get that green oil where there's a reaction with the copper. However, it's an option and it's something I do uh, a lot of because it, you again, cost benefit, you're reducing the risk massively from one uh, side and also the, the actual monetary cost as well. And you're saying we service a clock and then maybe let's just say for sake of argument, every 18 months, we inspect the lubrication. And if the lubrication has completely failed or really heavily contaminated, then stop the clock, don't run it. I am not a massive fan of having clocks running in the first place. Um, but the other option there is to add some lubrication to existing. So to answer Devashish's point, yes, there is a thing as far as I'm concerned of actually doing that. The other thing, of course, is that if the oil has either disappeared or gotten contaminated, or spread out, whatever, gone uh, gloopy or gluey, then there is no way around it. You have to disassemble the whole clock and uh, clean out the, uh, use a solvent typically, peg out the holes with your peg wood and then reassemble and put new oil on it. But of course, that's a massive um, risk cost to doing that as well. So how much oil phase two is the right amount of oil? Well, there is no definitive answer to this. Um, how we're we doing for time. Okay, we're doing well. We're doing good. So let's just have a look at some clock plates here. We, um, this one, which um, <laughs> has been raided for metal, which is a bit of a shame, but there you go. So look at this, this is really cool. So uh, let's zoom in as much as we can. We've got um, probably an 18th century, maybe early 19th century, uh, 30 hour? Might be an eight day clock, can't quite figure it out. It's can't wheel striking that. Um, anyway, there's a bit of metal now, but let's look at the bearing holes because that's what we're interested in. And what do you see? So come on, uh, quick on the quick on the buzzers there with your responses. Apart from the punched up holes, let's not talk about that today. You know that we all love punched up holes. Nothing wrong with that. Franklin uh, says no oil sinks. Ah, uh, well done, Franklin. Straight to the top of the class. The Dutch are on fire today. So there you go. No oil sink. Older clocks tended not to have them. They're kind of uh, a relatively modern invention. And so when you're working on clocks, if you get a clock, you probably won't be working on one quite in this condition, but let's say it's a full clock. Please don't go making oil sinks. An oil sink, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, is not a reservoir for oil. Um, what it is, I don't actually quite know, but it's certainly not for filling right up with oil. So yeah, a lot of early clocks didn't have oil sinks. Well spotted, Franklin. This one, which is a bit later, uh, does have oil sinks. And I'll get my pen out in a minute and show you what that means. There's one, uh, there's one, and uh, none round the center. So, uh, but you can actually see that the oil has run down the plate there. Uh, where's the reverse minute wheel? Might be one of those two. Anyway, what else have we got? Here's another one. So again, we've got a um, 19th century clock here. Are the remains of one oil sink, oil sink, little one on the center wheel, none on the um, uh, great wheel or few, um, yeah, fusey arbors, these, aren't they? None on there and so on and so forth. So don't start making big oil sinks if the clock didn't have them. And here's another 19th century clock uh, with oil sinks. Okay, so let's just have a look at our bearing in more um, kind of close up. So what is an oil sink? Is it a little notch? That's a very good question, Rachel. Just so happens, I've got my pad out ready to explain. Did you ask that question? Right. <laughs> also, 
Did you actually say um, that you don't like to have clocks running? Yeah. We think that's very strange. Who's we? Uh, me, Daryl and Devashi. <sighs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> right, so here's our axle. Oh, wonky axle. Derek says, uh, surely an oil sink lessens the bearing surface, so what's the point? So what's the point of what? Of an oil sink. I don't know. Yeah, lessens the bearing surface. I think that's a really good point. Where you've got those um, chunky 19th century clocks that everybody loves with really thick plates, like um, uh, spring-driven clocks, uh, spring-driven fusey clocks that are sometimes called bracket clocks. Um, they've got nice thick, nice thick plates. And yeah, you don't want the bearing surface to be as uh, wide. You know, the plates uniform in thickness, but at one end, you've got a chunky sort of 10 millimeter diameter barrel arbor bearing. And at the top, you've got a fly bearing, which is like a millimeter or something or less. So it makes sense that the plate is buried in thickness and an oil sink is uh, a way of uh, helping with that. I do think an oil sink is related to oiling, but my point is it's not for filling up with oil. It's not a reservoir for oil. And I'll show you why in a minute. So I'll start again with my drawing because the last one was a bit. Scan. So if we've seen some model, modern homely movements where the smaller pivots also have no oil sinks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing with those Hermler clocks is interesting because I don't know. I mean, I know there are service manuals for them, but it's difficult to kind of uh, tell whether um, they're actually meant to be serviced. I suppose the fact that there are service manuals probably says that they are meant to be serviced. Going for some crazy colour coding here, I don't know why. Here's our arbor, our axle that rotates uh, in the, so it's one half of our bearing. And here is our clock plate, which for some bizarre reason I've drawn in blue and I should have drawn it in yellow to represent brass. So it looks like steel, but it is in fact brass. So that's confusing to start with. Anyway, let's not worry about that. Let's draw our oil and we'll draw oil in pink. Um, <laughs> so apologies for the color coding. Didn't really think this through. So, okay. So um, we, you will remember back uh, to your uh, school physics lessons and the physics teacher when you were 13 years old sat in the class um, talking about the men thing called the meniscus. And uh, at that point, my eyes glazed over, which is probably a bit of a pun. And uh, that was the end of my schooling. But anyway, um, when we oil uh, the bearing, the liquid or the oil in the form of a liquid forms a meniscus round this bearing. So what we get is a little cupped bit here and a little cupped bit, something like that. And this thing here is all filled with oil. This is our oil sink, by the way. So an oil sink is just a depression uh, in the plate around the bearing. So normally the plate would come down here and it's been cut away. And that might be to shorten the working surface of the bearing. But I think there is an issue there with it making the clock easier to oil and also something to do with oil retention. If you've ever worked on watches uh, and regulators, you'll often see things like pinions that are undercut or in fact here, let me think how it is. Yeah, like a cutaway like that, in fact, um, on the arbor and that's for oil retention to prevent, the, to try and the oil will relatively happily spread along a flat surface, but it doesn't want to go around the corner. And so you often see these uh, cutaway pinions and things for oil retention. Anyway, so we've got our oil here uh, in, the, uh, in the bearing and we put some oil in. A rule of thumb, how much oil, uh, when you clean a clock or service a clock or something, then my advice would be is, uh, particularly when you're a beginner, is to oil everything a little bit and then go back after the clock has been on test, on your test stand for a couple of weeks and go around every bearing with um, your eyeglass. And let's get our clock back down here. Um, with no power on the thing. So here, 
looking at that with an eyeglass, wiggle the wheel in the frame so it jumps, the pivot jumps about a little bit like that, and check under low power magnification, you can see liquid oil there. If you can, then I would say that's probably enough. If it's puddling and running down the plate, then obviously that's too much. And hence my point about the oil sink. Normally this thing is uh, upright. So gravity is doing this to our oil. If we fill this up with oil like this, put loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of oil in. So it's all like this. All that happens is when the clock's upright like that is the oil puddles down here and then eventually runs out of the hole and which is bad enough, but it's not bad, but you know, people get excited about it, but it's not um, ideal, but it then drags what oil was in the hole with it. Hence my statement that oil sinks are not for filling up with oil. You know, when you oil, as I showed in the first instance, the bearing, the oil is kind of maybe like that and nothing more. Uh, so yeah, so when you oil the clock first for two reasons, firstly, put a bit on and then go back if you've got that luxury and just wiggle all the pivots with the power off. And if you can't see oil under low power magnification, then just add a little bit more. Um, if there's too much, then you can always draw a bit away from the hole by using a product called Pithwood, which we've seen before. So this is a bit of pith wood. It's um, an absorbent uh, material that comes out of a plant. And so if you've oiled and there's too much oil and you think it's going to run down the plate, then just get your pith wood and soak a bit of that oil away and maybe use a bit of isopropyl alcohol to clean around the pivot. Because if you've got oil on the plate surrounding the pivot hole, then that will tend to draw oil away. Was another question? Um, Andrew and uh, Derek say the oil sinks maybe help retain the oil. Yeah, I think they uh, don't also drag it. I, I agree. I think that's right. I think the oil sink, that edge, does help. You often see, in fact, where the bearing's been over-oiled a little bit, the oil started to run down, but it gets to the corner of the oil sink and it can't actually run around the corner. So, yeah, maybe that's another advantage of it. Again, it would be great if somebody did some research and presumably again the watch manufacturing world has done and I know that they use things like epilane which is a, um, a material that prevents the spreading of oil it's another good question that students used to ask why don't you use epilane on uh, I think they call it fix a drop is the uh, trade name for it on clocks and it's a really good question um, probably because the oil gets contaminated before uh, it sort of gets so much that it spreads around every way, everywhere anyway, because the cases are not sealed. So how much oil um, enough is the answer? Some oil's better than none and add some and then add a little bit more if necessary to make sure that you can see uh, liquid oil there. And if it begins to look like it's gonna puddle and run down the plate, then sucks them out with a bit of pithwood and clean around the bearing. Um, experience is a really useful thing. Um, two questions from yeah. Devashis. Why not use kitchen kit, kitchen towels yeah. um, instead of pithwood? And if you've got an alarm clock, yeah. do you have to clean it less frequently than um, a, a wall clock in, in the kitchen, for example? I mean, the two questions. So one question was, why not use kitchen paper? Don't use kitchen paper near your clocks, because if you look at, on a sunny day, get a bit of kitchen paper and just go like that in the light and you'll see a million tiny little fibers of uh, wood or whatever that stuff is made from. So don't use kitchen paper if you can help it uh, on, on the clocks because it just gets them really dusty. And also it tends to be um, not acid free as well. because obviously kitchen paper is for using then throwing away. So uh, I would just stick with pith wood um, because it's, I mean, it's quite expensive for what it is, but a little bit goes a heck of a long way. So no, I avoid kitchen paper and also avoid that blue, what I call elephant's loo paper. That's a sort of big blue roll of paper. Great for drying your hands, but I wouldn't use it on uh, clocks. I would use acid free products and so on. And the second question was... Do you clean alarm clocks less frequently than, say, a wall clock because they're enclosed? Yeah, I, uh, do you clean alarm clocks or any clock that's enclosed less frequently? 
Um, I think the answer is probably yes. But again, inspection is the key. You know, it takes, uh, I typically would say I can look at four clocks a day. That's taking the kit, moving out of the case, taking hands and dial off, looking at the lubrication. So it takes a quarter of a day um, as far as I'm concerned. But actually, of course, you've got a long case clock. It takes about 10 seconds just to stick your head around the corner and uh, look at the lubrication. So it may be that a clock like an alarm clock needs oil in less frequently, but that does bring up another problem because the oil, even if it's in its bottle, you know, doing nothing doesn't last forever anyway. So it has a kind of shelf life. So um, I would say, and this take this all with a massive pinch of salt. In fact, don't take any notice of anything I say, but I would say if your clock has just been sitting there and it hasn't even been running, if the oil is more than 10 to 15 years old, the chances are, particularly if it's uh, um, uh, natural oil, that it will be going acid and it'll be reacting with the copper and you'll get that kind of green gluey stuff and it's time to uh, clean the thing. So um, no oil's better than none. Um, how much oil enough is the answer. Bigger bearings obviously need more oil than smaller bearings. You've got to learn, which isn't a particularly useful thing, but just look and check you can see that the bearing is lubricated. And also when you begin, particularly if you're beginning on two or even three train clocks, it's ever so easy to miss a bearing. So it's really useful to do your oiling, have the clock on test. And then when you're a beginner particularly, go back and just check that every bearing and bearing surface is actually lubricated. So um, the third and frankly least important element of all this in watches, in clocks, sorry, not in watches, is what kind of oil do you use? And I don't know is the answer. All I can tell you is what I use. And as I said, a lot of people get really excited about this. Um, I use uh, a brand called Mobius, but there's other good uh, brands. What I would say, is that I personally would avoid for the majority of my lubrication of clocks, lubricants that are made uh, not for clocks or by clock people. And the reason for that is that you don't have any kind of comeback because presumably um, those people are gonna say, well, our oil or lubricant isn't made for a clock anyway in the first place. So there's something I would say broadly stick to a brand like Dr. Tilvich or, um, Mobius, I'm sure there are others that are made and they say on it, clock oil for clocks. At least you can ring up the manufacturer and say, what's going on with my um, oil for clocks? So there are broadly three kinds of oil, okay? There's uh, fully synthetic oil. Here's some uh, watch oil by Mobius. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, it's 9010. And well, it just looks like oil. It comes in a little um, thing, which I can never get the lid out almost impossible to get out of the can. So um, here's two milliliters of uh, synthetic, fully synthetic uh, clock oil. And you can buy this, uh, um, watch oil, sorry. And you can buy this in all different um, pressure ratings and uh, viscosities. So very broadly, and again, I'm not, it's not my subject specialist field, but the more viscous an oil is, very broadly, the more pressure it can withstand. So when you've got your clock, like uh, your long case clock, or even better, something like one of those weight driven uh, regulators that people often call Vienna regulators, and some of them are from Vienna, but you know the ones I mean, the uh, South, Southern German ones. Um, they've got a, quite a range of uh, diameters of bearings and load on the bearings. So let's just say, for instance, uh, without getting into the, it too much, that the load is proportional to the gear ratio. Okay, so we know that on these bearings here, uh, which are the main uh, arbor, winding arbor bearings or great wheel bearings, you've got, um, for sake of argument, you've got a 12 pound weight and you, that's divided by two because it's on a pulley. So you've got six pounds load at about one inch uh, radius, okay. So if we've got say 10 to one ratio here or eight to one, my maths is absolutely hopeless. So we've got an eighth 
of the um, load on this wheel here, which is uh, the center wheel, then you've got a 64th um, uh, of the load on this wheel, which is called the upper intermediate wheel by law. Now in this country, not allowed to call it the third wheel anymore. And then this wheel here, the escape wheel, you've got whatever um, 64 times eight is uh, an amount less. So you can see in this clock, there's a big range of pressures. So you don't put the same oil ideally on all the wheels. You put thick, gloopy, high viscosity, relatively high viscosity oil on the, uh, on the highly loaded bearings. And you might say, well, it would be great to put them on the small bearings as well, because it's going to mean the clock's going to run for, uh, you know, last a reduced wear, which is true, but the friction within the oil uh, would stop the clock if you put really gloopy oil on this, and particularly those regulators I was talking about, and Derek talking about his 400-day uh, clocks or his torsion pendulum clocks, thick oil, if any oil at all in the top of the train, is just going to stop the clock. So, in a watch, um, you have a range of viscosities of oil, depending on where in the train it is. And you have the same thing in a clock. And in the old days, um, oiled days, I used to use three oils. I used to use Mobius uh, D5 on the lower end of the trail, train, trail, which we've pour a bit out. Um, oh, 52. Let's get our oil stand. So if we pour, sorry, excuse teeth, some D5 out, I maybe can't do it so you can see it, you'll see straight away that it's incredibly sort of gloopy with, ah, sorry about that, incredibly gloopy with um, like long chains. You can see that? So that's your D5. So I would use that on an along case clock on the great wheel, on the pallet faces of the escapement, on center wheel, on the hammer arbor, and so on. So anything that's relatively slow moving, high pressure. But if you use that throughout the clock on the escape wheel or the fly, for instance, it'd have a significant effect on, um, on the performance of the clock. So I've used to use D2 as well, or even D1, which is thinner less viscous and I've given all that up uh, for just two oils now because that's kind of complicated enough so if we just pour out some d3 um I don't know if you can see there but immediately and I'm gonna mix up my toasties now just clean my oiler and if you can see that but it's a lot less viscous than the d5 um and you might use a thinner oil again in fact what I do is if I'm moving up to something very lightly loaded, then I would move to a watch oil uh, like this 9020, or even this one, which is even thinner, which is 9010. Okay, so in an ideal world, given all the money, all the time, all the stuff we've got, you'd use a, a viscosity of oil that was appropriate for the loading of the bearing. That makes sense. Um, but, uh, not Bergeon, Mobius have got a great website and they actually have got like spider diagrams for all the lifespans and the viscosities and the loadings of the oil. And I'm sure for a watch, they will tell you exactly which, what, which oil to use where. In a clock, uh, you'll have to do it by trial and improvement. Because I don't think, again, that information exists. And if it does exist, then please let us know, because I'd love to see what people say about it. Now, I remember I'm not saying if you just use one oil and you use oil that you get from the chip shop or whatever, I think that's fine because um, uh, some oil is better than no oil. But if, as you're working through the resolution of the whole question of oiling, then, uh, as I say, I've gone from three to two viscosities just because it's uh, um, not a problem, but just to keep life relatively simple. So. Yeah. So would you say natural or synthetic oil is preferred? Um, Chris has had issues with natural uh, oil thickening up too quickly. Yeah, well, I think, uh, Chris, um, thank you for that question. It's a great question. So natural, mineral or synthetic, they're your three uh, ranges of oil. So natural oil presumably is something that comes out of a plant or an animal, but presumably a plant nowadays, um, don't know what it is, but some 
oil from seeds or something. Mineral is the stuff that you dig up from the earth and refine it. And then synthetic is a synthesized version of that, which is probably based on mineral oil anyway. I don't quite know. So in a watch, and I'm not talking about watches, um, a synthetic oil makes a whole lot of sense because a watch and modern watch is sold on this kind of performance. And let's say you've got a service interval of four years. I don't know what the service interval is. You want the performance of that watch to be consistent over that period. So synthetic makes sense. And I'm not anti-synthetic for, um, for domestic clocks either. But the problem is you can put synthetic oil, uh, the best oil in the world on your clock, and it kind of doesn't make any difference because in most environments after X years or hours on display, um, the oil's going to be contaminated, even if it's still in really good condition. And my pet theory is that an oil that goes thick and gloopy after, let's say, three to five years is a good thing, because what it means is the clock stops and then the client slash owner is sort of forced, if you like, to have oil added, an inspection, or they have to clean the thing. Whereas with synthetic oil, is it not the case that if the oil is really good and stable for, let's say, eight to 10 years, that that oil could be really contaminated after three years, let's say, for instance, but it goes on for another five or six years. So the clock will run, but the whole thing is grinding away with airborne contamination. I mean, I don't know. Again, it needs some uh, peer reviewed uh, research, please. Our professional institutions, you know who you are. Um, so it's a good, a good point. And my theory is totally just something on the back of a fact packet. So again, I treat it with a, 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 a bit of respect. But so at one end, you've got um, natural oils, which are relatively inexpensive. The other end, you've got synthetic oils, which are relatively expensive. And in the middle, you've got this stuff, which is a mixture of mineral and natural oil. So partly for um, stability, partly for uh, cost, but not really, because oil isn't a big deal in the big makeup of things. Um, I go with that, but I'm happy to consider synthetic oil. And if a client specifically asked for it, I would obviously say, why are you interested in that? And if we could come to some agreement, I, you know, I'd use it. I don't particularly mind. And I'm interested in going back to using natural oil too, for the reason that I said about the fact that after three to five years, it'd be quite convenient, not for making money, but just for the kind of life span of the clock to disassemble it. Um, so would you use a thinner oil, like a watch oil on a strike fly pivot? Yeah, on um, something like um, a uh, weight driven uh, southern German wall clock. Yeah, I'd maybe use that 90, that stuff, 9020, that one there um, on uh, a striking train for a wall clock. But as I said, just go on the website for Mobius, even if you don't use their oils, there's a really good cross-reference chart on there that what they recommend uh, is used on which oils, alarm clocks, wall clocks, and, uh, and so on. And do your experiments. A really useful thing that we're probably about time away, yeah. Really useful thing to do in terms of the spreading and oxidation for oils is um, to get a piece of brass. This is a bit of paper, by the way, and um, mark it out into inch squares like this, your sheet of brass, drill holes in the middle, put little steel pins in to represent arbors, and then put oil sinks around them, and then put, uh, so you've got this all over the plate, and put your favorite oils on here, scratch on the plate what the date and the oil was, and uh, put it under a piece of glass to keep the dust off, keep it horizontal, and just look at how much those oils spread and evaporate over time. It's actually a really useful exercise. We used to do it at college and it was really shocking the difference, whether one was good or bad. That's it. What's, what's, is that Ian? What's that Ian? What's the book? Ah, yes. Okay. Who, who, who wrote that chapter? Is that Jonathan's chapter? Not the book. The... Jonathan Betts. Yeah. So that was written by Jonathan Betts. In fact, Jonathan's just uh, about to publish another book with James Nye and um, Anthony Turner about the history of uh, clocks in general. And I think he's covering a lot of repair. So yes, that's a really useful thing. Thank you for that, Ian. 
so yeah um a little grid like that with your uh in fact i might make one for next week if i get time which you probably want uh to test your oil and that's useful to see how it spreads because you know if it's spreading like that on your test plate then your client's clock that's somewhere off in the country wherever it is is probably spreading like that too so very little definitive there i'm afraid i'm pretty open-minded about um sort of the lubrication for uh for clocks i don't try to get too excited about it there's a whole uh, gnarly issue of mainsprings. Again, I was looking at a clock yesterday that had uh, a, an oil on the mainspring and inevitably for some reason, the oil runs out of the barrels and drips at the bottom and gets in the grape wheel teeth. So I prefer to use a liquid spray grease on my mainsprings. Um, but again, no peer reviewed research on that, I'm afraid. So yeah, uh, check that your clock has got oil on it. Secondly, be mindful of the amount of oil uh, you've got in there and either add or subtract so you've got an amount of uh, um, liquid oil there. And then thirdly, if you get all that sorted out, then by all means, uh, experiment with different kinds of oil, uh, looking at how they spread, how they evaporate and how they're stable. Um, the natural oils do tend to go acid over a period of time, which, as I said, reacts with the copper. So if you've got a clock that's likely to be not serviced for a long time, whatever that is, then again, you might consider a synthetic oil, which is more stable and less likely uh, to react. I think it's kind of um, open to negotiation. So maybe you can join us on our Facebook group for further discussion, or in fact, we can talk about it next week some more if you want, but we're out of time. So um, draw, draw some breath. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks to Open Clock Club here for running the live chat, which we now up to more than a hundred chats, wow. And um, I hope that was of some use. Yeah, uh, John is on Facebook. Please remember if you've got a clock on the bench, to share a work in progress photographs and observations with our Facebook users. That's really useful. And if uh, we don't see you on Facebook, we'll probably do a live stream on Thursday. I think I'm around. Uh, and then we'll see you next Saturday for our 49th Open Clock Club. So have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy your horology. And we will see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>